Hello and welcome fellow time travellers, it's great to have you with me as we journey through a million years of history together, get us. Uh, this week we're in Wiltshire, uh, around four and a half thousand years ago, walking beneath the great trilithons of Stonehenge, one of the uncontested wonders of the world. But before we get started, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who signed up to my Patreon site. Your support helps make this podcast possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're not a member yet and you want to join, simply go to patreon.com and search for me by name. That's Neil Oliver. And you will get, in return, thought-provoking videos every week uh, exclusive to Patreon. Okay, now it's time for the next episode of my love letter to the British Isles. So strap yourself into the time machine and cue the music. You're looking down at something that is quite beautiful. It's very obvious, when you see it from above, it jumps out at you. Because on the ground it's so big, you can't, it, it kind of looks like random stones. But when you get above it, it suddenly all makes sense. You can see the vision. This week's podcast takes us across a powerful ritual landscape to the world's largest stone circle. Tons of chalk dug with antler picks and muscle. The cove stone, weighing nearly 100 tons at its heart. Circles within circles, and circles in time, charting the seasons and bringing people together to a place that's now clouded, cloaked in wonder and mystery, but that once meant so much. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last podcast, we travelled to one of the most famous monuments in the world, the magical Stonehenge. Where's the next stop on our journey? Well, just next door to Stonehenge is an extraordinary place that always sets my mind racing whenever I visit. It's massive in scale and also in intent. It's a true Neolithic marvel. It's the Avebury Stone Circles. To describe it as a circle of stones is to diminish it. It's so much more than that. It's like with so much of the things that we think about that are Stone Age in the Mesolithic, in the Neolithic, even the Paleolithic, we only find the stone by and large, or, or it forms by far the, the, the majority of, of what is left behind by the people. You know, hence, hence Stone Age. You know, so people are invited to think in passing that these people, their lives were made of stone. You know, it's like it's like the Flintstones. You're invited to consider people with stone beds and stone couches, and as though they had no wish for nor appreciation of the softer and finer things of life. So these the stone circles, like Stonehenge, uh, like the Chamber Tomb of West Kenna, and like Avebury, you know, we see the stones and we see the ditch, the the rock cut ditch cut down into into the chalk. But there would have been so much more. It, it's like finding the, you know, this a sort of calcified, desiccated skeleton, and the bones are 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 not the person. And in the same way that if if you were to come across a skeleton, in order to appreciate it as a person, you would have to, with your mind's eye, clothe it again with flesh and bone and tissue and veins and a blood supply and a pumping heart and clothes and and thoughts and all, and all, everything else that goes into making a, a human being. Well, likewise with these. With these stone monuments, as well as seeing the stone, you have to imagine them full of people. People being like the blood in a circulatory system, you know, and a, a pumping heart of belief and and uh, and symbolism and uh, and these, these these people just using the, the stones as a, as the skeleton or the scaffolding that was holding up an idea that's now invisible to us. But you have to go in search of and try and imagine what was the the inspiration. 
the imagination that made these places matter. How do you connect with these people? Imagine, you know, if you walk into now in the countryside, you might find, in, in certain of the more remote locations, you might find a ruined church. And it, it, it may well be the case that all that stands are, are the four walls, no roof, uh, windows without glass, a, a doorway without a door, and you would walk in. But because we know what a church is for, it, it's quite straightforward for us. Whether you're Christian or not, or, or a person of faith, you're aware of the concept of religion. And you, and you can walk into a church and walk into a ruined abbey, you know, one of the monasteries that was taken apart during the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII. And although, although you're only looking at maybe the, the lower courses of, of the walls, you know what happened in there. You know that it was about Christianity and faith in God and you know that services and rituals and prayers went on and there was a whole, uh, there was a whole life in the thing. Well, so, so it is with these, uh, with these Stone Age monuments. You have to be able to, uh, you have to make room for everything else that's absent. In the same way that a skeleton is not a person, neither is a neither is a stone circle. The whole story of what these people were thinking, and that a place like Stonehenge or like Avebury, we don't know. But there's no reason to to overlook the possibility that the stones might have been painted, or they might have been they might have been festooned with animal skins or fabrics of some kind or another. You know, they may have been, you know, in a gory sense, they might have been daubed with blood, animal and human. Uh, there would have been fires, in all likelihood, flaming torches, fires, great bonfires, shadows cast against the stones, uh, all sorts of life going on, people milling around. It's incumbent upon all of us, if, if we have any wish to make these places matter, to if we go and visit a place like Avebury, you have to try and imagine everything else that's made absent by the absence of the people and by the absence of the, of the meaning that they brought to the place because they knew what Avebury was for. Avebury is the, Avebury is the biggest of them all. In terms of the stone circles anywhere, anywhere in the world, you know, Avebury's, Avebury's up there with the biggest of them. It's, it's vast. Basically, what you have at Avebury is a circular ditch uh, that was cut down into the, into the chalk, through the turf, through the soil, down into the, the rock. Imagine setting your back to that kind of labour. I mean, chalk in the, in the kind of, in the top 40, list of rocks, chalk is amongst the softer, but it's still it's still hard. And when all you have to dig it out are tools of stone and maybe deer antler and wood, it's quite an undertaking. And the ditch the ditch at Avebury at one point was, you know, 30 feet deep. 20 feet across. It's huge. It's now when you go, it's kind of because it's all slumped and subsided, it's V-shaped. You know, it's a V, but it would have been straight, straight sides, vertical. When it was freshly cut, it was straight sided, 30 feet deep. Uh, so imagine an undertaking like that. And it's huge. So there's an outer circle with a bank, all the rubble heaped up as a bank. And then inside it, there are two more circles, effectively a northern one and a southern one. So there's three circles at Avebury. One gigantic outer circle, huge. I mean, when you go to Avebury now, there's a village inside it. <laughs> it's a colossal thing. And these two, the two circles, smaller circles within it. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about how Stonehenge was uh, started with a circular ditch and a bank. And then some stones were brought in and they were there for a while. And then somebody else thought they should go and be replaced with other stones. And over centuries, a thousand years, people were adding and taking away, augmenting, imposing their own vision upon the place. And so it is at Avebury. The people were, uh, were adding and subtracting, and the thing grew and, and changed its shape. For example, at the heart of the northern circle, so you've got the outer circle and then the northern, and the, at the heart of the northern circle there's a, there's a thing called the cove. 
And it's just called the Cove by the people. It's been called the Cove for the longest time. And it, it has as part of it, it there's a, a stone, a, a boulder, and they're all made of the sarsen, which was once upon a time, uh, the whole of that area was covered with what was effectively a crust of silicified limestone. And then with the action of erosion and weathering, it, it broke up into boulders rather than a complete crust. So the whole landscape was littered with, with this material. And it's known to us as sarsen. And as a stonehenge, it was used to, to create the upright stone circle there. So sarsen stones were available at, at Avebury. But this thing, the cove at the heart of the north circle, uh, it weighs over 100 tonnes. And mo- most of it, or, or at least half of it, is, is out of sight. It's, it's, in the, you know, it's buried in the ground, like an iceberg. You, know, you can't see most of it. And in all likelihood, it's where it always was. It was just there. You know, there's no one really thinks that these people were moving a boulder that weighed 100 tonnes. Not with, the, not with the technology that they had available to them. And so it may well be the case that before there was anything man-made at Avebury, amongst other lumps of sarsen, there was this thing this boulder that had just always been there. And it may have attracted the attention of the hunters. You know, the people, the earliest people who were roaming about that part of the landscape may have seen and been amazed by this boulder. Because you would be, if you came across a a boulder weighing 100 tonnes, you'd you'd, you'd pause and have a look at it. And it may well be the case that it inspired everything that came next. The farmers may have looked at that boulder and thought, that's maybe been left behind by the people that made the world or the, or the giants that created this landscape and maybe we should build around it in a kind of a, a, a homage, a celebration of this great boulder. So that thing, the cove, may have been the, the inspiration, the spark, the natural spark that inspired people to create everything that's around it. And so their ideas were just fired up then. So they started building the, you know, the circles of stone that are now the Avebury Monument. And when we talk, we talk about that ditch that was dug. And it's easy if you say it quick, you know, they dug this, this huge circular ditch, but calculations have been done, imagining how long it might have taken to do it. And you're, you're talking probably in excess of one million man hours. So the ambition, when people were standing about looking at the cove and thinking we should build something here, someone steps forward and says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And they set out to build this, to dig this circle into the chalk. This is no casual undertaking. This is no doodle on a pad while you're making a phone call. This requires uh, mustering and controlling and and choreographing effort on a massive scale to get this done, to dig the ditch and then to heave these sarsen boulders into position. And there's all sorts of ideas going on. Some are kind of squat and kind of, you know, uh, square or block shaped. And and some of them tend to be more kind of narrow and tall and there's been a suggestion that the wide ones might be feminine. You know, you might be in a kind of a, an outsized representation of, of um, feminine hips, childbearing hips, width. And that the tall ones might be phallic and, and, and might represent maleness. They've not been worked mostly. They're mostly, they're quite, they're, they're the natural boulders just set up on edge, you know, put upright into, you dig a hole and then you tip, you tip the stone in until about a third of it is, is in the socket, like a tooth, like a tooth in your jaw, and the rest of it sticks up and, it, and it's balanced. But, so there's been this interpretation that there might be a representation of the, of the male, the, the masculine and the, and the feminine. But in reality, you go to it now, you know, 5,000 years later, and you can just be astounded. By all means, just go and be astounded by that place. How do you get your head around places like this? I think I am uh, 
The, uh, I'm always most troubled by why. I look at a thing on this scale, you know, the, the, the sheer circumference of it, the width of the circle, the scale, the, you know, a ditch 30 feet deep cut into rock, and boulders, each of them weighing tens of tons. And you have the first thing I always think is, how seriously would you have to care about an idea to embark upon this? It's not casual. It's it's something that took people generations to accomplish. And when archaeologists have looked at the say the ditch in particular, think about how you would start digging a ditch. You would put a, a staff in the ground, and and lead out a, a rope, and walk around us and walk a circle around it. You know how you would make a circle in the grass. So they must have marked out the circle, in that way more or less, and then they start to dig. Maybe you start in one place and work round, or maybe you've got teams of people in, in segments, and they gradually work out and they meet. They gradually work towards one another around the, the circumference of the thing. But however they did it, archeo- archaeological excavation of the ditch has demonstrated that even as it was being finished for the first time, when the, when the people had gone around once to create the circle, you know, 30 feet deep, 20 feet wide, the, the beginning, the earliest bits of it were already subsiding and slumping. Because it's only soft, it's you know it's chalk and it's, it collapses. At no point was any attempt made to clear that out so that it ever looked perfect. You would think if you and I were embarking on digging a massive circular ditch, lovely and white, into the chalk, you'd want it to look lovely. You'd want to be able to stand back and go, there it is, finished. It's pristine. The Avebury Circle never looked like that for a moment. By the time they completed the circle, it was already filling itself in, and they never tidied it up. So, for a start, when you talk, when you ask me, how do I get my imagination going? It's knowing that these people embarked upon the challenge of creating without really consciously having it in mind that they would ever finish it. Now, doesn't that make it seem all the stranger? (laughs) If you were going to decide to build something huge that was going to take you and your comrades maybe a lifetime to do, or maybe it would have to be taken on by your children, you'd think you'd be working towards it being finished. Well, it never was. And when eventually, after whatever use it was put to, and for however long, when people decided for themselves, we don't need this anymore. You know, we mentioned earlier about the dissolution of the monasteries. Right? So the monasteries were were broken up and sold off, and you know, to break the power of the of the Catholic Church in England. You know, when Henry VIII decided to be the, the leader of the church, when people decided for whatever reason that they, f- they were finished with Avebury, they walked away from it, and it was never finished. It was still a work in progress up until the minute when they decided they didn't need it anymore. It's like the the Sagrada Familia uh, Cathedral in, in in Barcelona that's never been finished, and that guy's been working on it, you know, all his life, and you know they're still trying to finish it. Well, it's like if they walked away from that cathedral tomorrow and said, "No, don't, that's it, don't need it anymore." Well, well, something like that happened at Avebury. The the act of making it was what kept the people together, and at the very moment when a generation, a, a, a living generation decided, no, that was it, it was over. And yet it remained as it had always been, unfinished. It's very, very hard to get your mind, it's impossible to get your mind into that Neolithic way of thinking. Whatever it was they were expressing by creating it, it was the act of making that mattered, not finishing. And it must have been important for them. Yes, like like the Nessa Brodger on Orkney, like Stonehenge, it would have had a name and people in the wider world would have known of its existence for sure and would have come to see it. It mattered and it mattered for a long time. 
you know, we're talking about these places being in use for generation after generation after generation, much like a cathedral. You know, it's it's being it's made, augmented, adjusted, altered, but continually used throughout. And then there comes a day when, for whatever reason, they say, "No, this doesn't work anymore. We don't need it," and they just turn their backs on it and walk away. And when, you know, by the time uh, by the time anyone was paying attention again, it was in the act of being taken apart. You know, we've talked before about how uh, these places once that once Christianity was across the world and across the land, uh, evidence of of places that that seemed to be. A, Related to some other, some other earlier, older religion, th- these places were often treated with suspicion, and and there were often concerted attempts, concerted efforts to to get rid of them. And in the case of Avebury, uh, the villagers, the people were were breaking the, the stones up. You, they would they would set fire. They would they would build up wood and and straw around them, and set fire, and it would make them brittle, and then they could hit them hit the big boulders with hammers. And shatter them into building, and then they were they were in the process of using the the for building material for walls and and for building their houses and their cottages and whatever. Um, and so a lot of it's missing. What's there now is just is just a fragment of what was originally there. There were once many many more stones, but they've been smashed out and broken up. Uh, and to some extent, it, it it happened that process of it being taken apart. It coincided with um. Uh, an 18th century churchman, come antiquarian, a kind of a a kind of a, an early archaeologist called William Stukeley, uh, who, who at the time was roaming around the the British landscape, visiting these places, places like Avebury, and recording them, making drawings of them, and writing them up, and wondering what they were. And, and when he came to Avebury, he was pretty convinced that these places had been built by the Druids that they had been built as temples by the Druids. You know, he's thousands of years out, but at least he, he's regarded to some... He's one of the fathers of archaeology because he began... The, although his interpretations were wide of the mark, uh, he was beginning the process of paying these uh, places proper attention and being scientific about it, measuring them, drawing them, recording them. And he said to the people, you've got to stop. You've got to stop breaking this up. And, and by that time... So much time had elapsed, people had forgotten what these places had ever. They didn't know what they were. And the ditch and bank is so big at Avebury that unless you've got the opportunity to be up in the air, you know, like in a hot air balloon or, or with a drone, you can't see, it's too big. You can't take it in as one thing unless you can get up above it. And so the people thought that the ditch and the bank were natural. It was on such a scale that it hadn't occurred to anyone that human beings had made it. They thought it was, well, maybe the work of the devil, but but just as likely the work of a river or, or natural processes had created this thing. And it took William Stukeley to come along in the 18th century and look at it and go, ho, 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 hang on, this is a perfect circle. And inside it, there's another couple of circles. You, you know, he, you, and then, and then every, to everyone's surprise, the, for the first time in thousands of years, they were confronted with what the Avebury stone circles actually were. How extraordinary. And because so much of it was missing, because they had effectively smashed so many teeth out of it, uh, you know, it was incomplete anyway. And it took him to look at it and go, oh, hold on, this is a man-made Structure. This has been designed and built, and he he thought it was something left behind by the druids, but but it, but and, and although he was wrong about that, it, at least he knew it for what it was, an ancient structure, and it was you know in no small part down to his intervention that we've got what we do have of Avebury, and they stopped they stopped smashing it down. <laughs> Quite an extraordinary collection of history at Avebury, isn't it? All cheek by jowl. I mean, there's a village dating back to the Anglo-Saxons, which is actually within the circles themselves. Do you not remember there was a there was a television series for kids that I remember when I was 10, 11, 12, 
I can't remember what it was called off the top of my head, but it was a, it was a kind of a ghostly story about a village surrounded by a stone circle, and there were all sorts of ghostly goings on. Well, it was inspired by the reality of Avebury, which is a village inside a inside a stone circle. But yeah, it, it's kind of being uh, it's in the process, I suppose, of being reabsorbed by the world that came after the Neolithic. You know, it was kind of being consumed by the, you know, by the centuries and the millennia that came after its existence. And then fortunately, you know, ever since, you know, the 18th century and then antiquarians like Stukeley and others we've begun to value these places and to set them aside and say, you know, we can't just turn this into a car park or build an office block on top. We should we should really be paying attention to these things. And so they have been protected one way or another ever since. Have artefacts been found that help explain what's going on here? Yes, they do. I mean, they're, 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 enough has been found at places like Abra and others that they're, they're clearly associated with rituals that go on around death. You know, there's human remains there. But as is the case with all of these stone circles, with Stonehenge and the rest of them, there are alignments on, you know, midsummer and midwinter. I mean, people at places like Avebury have attracted eccentrics as well as scientists over the years. And, and all sorts of complicated theories have been worked out, people drawing lines and, and being determined that there are alignments of all sorts. And some of them are, some of them are real and some of them are fanciful as well as being re- related to the rituals of, of the seasons of the year, you know, harvest and winter and springtime. And, uh, they're definitely to do with keeping track of time in a kind of a, you know, a great a celestial calendars. You know, they're all, they are, they are aligned and they are paying attention to the sun and the moon and the stuff, you know, th- th- that's what they are. That's what they're about. These are people that, that feel themselves fixed in the landscape. They're a fixed point. And, and the universe revolves around them. And, and if you want to keep track of movement, you need a fixed point. You know, you need something that's, that's permanent and doesn't move. And, and so places like Avebury and Stonehenge, in part, in, in amongst other reasons for having them, they functioned as these fixed points that made sense of the of the turning of the year in the sky above. So it's a bit like a giant clock. It's almost like the opposite of a clock in a way. A clock mechanism moves and the hands move and they mark time. Well, of course, the stones don't move, but the cosmos moves around them. I suppose you could say that a thing like A, but it's like the it's like the centre point on a clock face, you know, and the hands are fixed there and they move, but the centre point doesn't move. And so a stone circle is a bit is a it gives you a fixed point of reference. It doesn't move, and as the, as the sky moves relative to it, you can you can tell where you are in the year, depending on where the sun's rising, where the sun's setting, and so on. What does Avery look like from above? Well, it's it, it's, uh, it's it's symmetrical. You know, the circle is is right. You know, it is a, it is a it is a circle, and you've got these two smaller circles inside it. Um, and it's quite a. I mean, I suppose it looks from the from the air. Uh, I've been in a helicopter over Avebury. I've been in a helicopter over Stonehenge, and I suppose it looks like a piece of abstract art in a way. You know, you're looking down at something that is quite beautiful, you know, and it's it's very obvious. When you see it from above, it jumps out at you. Because on the ground it's so big, you can't... It, it kind of looks like random stones. And you can only see maybe a bit of the, of the circular ditch at a time. But when you get above it, it suddenly all makes sense. You can see the vision. But that, of course, is fascinating in itself, because, of course, the people that designed it and built it never had the opportunity to see it from above. You know, whether it crossed their minds that this thing might be being looked down upon by some something in the sky, well, your guess is as good as mine. Whether they, whether they imagined that anybody was up there, ancestors or spirits or a god or gods, looking down, well, that would be, that would be just supposition. 
but it's certainly the only way in which it's on such a scale that you can only see it in its entirety from above, which is a which is a perspective on it that its builders never had. There, these places, you know, it's so important. But we've, we've talked about the idea before that there are places in the landscape that people can rely on. You know, this act of making, which doesn't seem to make sense. You know, why would you draw out a a process of construction across centuries? Why wouldn't you just build it and use it? Well, it's because part of its function was that, like a magnet, an Avebury would attract people. And presumably, when when farming farming people are busy people, hard-working people, but once the crop is in... During that period when it's growing and ripening and before you can harvest it, you know, there, there is a period of time where you can busy yourself with something else. And it, it, it's not too far-fetched to imagine that places like Avebury, people relied on them because they would know that maybe in the midst of the summer months or maybe in the midst of winter, again, when there's not much you can do, you can't do anything as a farmer in winter, the ground might be frozen, nothing grows. And likewise, in the middle of summer, when all you're doing is waiting on the, on the harvest, it would be important to know that there were places where you could go and find others like yourself. You know, if you live for most of the year, look what we do all the time. You know, at, at the best of times, people reach out to others via Facebook and the internet and telephony. People are always trying to reach out and make contact with other people. And at the time of, you know, the COVID-19 virus and people are isolated in their homes and they're desperate to reach out and they know that they can use things like Zoom or FaceTime or Facebook or any of these platforms to reach people. Well, in a world of 5,000 years ago, people still felt the strong urge to know where they could make contact with other people. So by creating these, these sites that are always under construction forever, West Kennet, Stonehenge, Avebury, Silbury Hill. People live in their isolated lives at certain specific points in the year, which they can track by knowing where the sun is setting every night. They can know that it's the time of year now. This is the month when everyone will be at Avebury and they'll be at the Nessa Brodger and they'll be at Stonehenge. And if we go, we can find people. We can find wives for our sons. We can find husbands for our daughters, we can find more flint for making tools, we can find clay pots for storing food, and we can just get on with the business of being with lots of folk. And so these these places functioned because their lifespan was drawn out over generations and centuries. People could rely on them, could always go to Avebury and meet people. And, And that might have been what they were for, just as much as any rituals or ceremonies or ceremonies of thanksgiving or sacrifices to the gods of fertility and everything else that might have gone on there. Underneath all of that, fundamental was having places where you could go and find people, because that's what life's all about. So at its heart, there was a powerful social element... Obviously, the people have been, you know, everything from UFOs to <laughs> all sorts of uh, uh, meanings and significance that have been attributed to the pyramids and to Stonehenge and to all the rest of it. Uh, and, and for sure, these places would have been uh, the setting for rituals and ceremonies. Of course they were. But as you say, at least as important for people was knowing that you could go there and be people. You know, that's what, that's what churches have always meant. You know, before our sort of pious approach to places like, you know, St Paul's Cathedral, you know, the old St Paul's Cathedral, before the one that Sir Christopher Wren rebuilt, you know, the illustrations of it, it's of a busy place, full of people at all times, you know, it, it, it functioned as a place where people could go and meet and, and yeah, go and, and worship, but but more than anything else, it was a place where there were other people. You know, that's what these places were for. And, and if, if you were a, a farming community 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, you knew that on a Sunday everybody would be at church. 
So that would be a reason to go to church. As well as, as, well as being, you know, in, in fear of God and having to go there and, and do what the minister told you and, and behave and, and, and behave in a Christian fashion, people would have had a, an inclination to go to church every Sunday because that's where people were. So that's, what a place, that's how a place like Avebury or, or a Stonehenge would function also. Whatever else was going on, you could go and catch up. Avebury and Stonehenge are close to each other in terms of distance, but were they around at the same time? Yes, they, have, they, they overlap. They overlap. Stonehenge, you know, it, it kicks off probably about 3100 BC. You people, people start building there. It's very difficult to know how long the place, the location mattered. Archaeology takes you back to the, to the start of digging the ditch or, or putting the stones in place. But like with Stonehenge or with Avebury or, or with the place that is now has Silbury Hill sitting on top of it, you don't know how long the place mattered just as a set of coordinates you know, just as a just as a location, and these places might have been revered. Maybe something happened there. Something connected to a person, or a, or a battle, or a or a you know, there might have been a reason why these locations were were fixed in people's memories, and they may have been places that people gathered long before there was anything like a circle, or a single standing stone. You know, so it's difficult to say, was Stonehenge first? Was Avebury first? Because the, the first reason, how do you find, how do you find when people were, were, were gathering in numbers in a location? It's difficult. But these places functioned, they were, they were uh, contemporary with one another. They were all, they were all, they were all, that landscape was, was a network of places, burial tombs, stone circles, henges. There are uh, monuments called curses monuments where you've got people were digging long parallel ditches, sometimes for miles, two ditches side by side, throwing up a bank either side, quite close together, these, these ditches across the landscape. You can only see them from the air. These things went forgotten and unnoticed for the longest time, and then with the advent of aerial photography, you know, during the wars, you know, planes flying over World War I, World War II, pilots were looking down and for the first time seeing things, these vast Constru- and good grief, that's, that's straight lines. You couldn't see them on the ground. So these landscapes were absolutely engraved with expressions of what these people were thinking. These, these people had a, had a cosmology and an understanding of the universe and their place within it, and they were expressing it in these, with these large-scale building projects. And in Wiltshire, in that part of England, for sure, these these monuments connect up. They were part of a they were part of a ritual landscape. And, and at some point it would have it would have made sense in its entirety to the people that lived with it and among it and who were in the habit of augmenting it and adjusting it as the years went by. When did the first building work begin? People seem to have started paying attention to that location, to the place that, that became Avebury, from say maybe th- three and a half thousand years BC. They were they were they were they were there, and they were they were making use of the location. When it comes to the actual construction, when they actually start digging ditches and then starting to think about raising stones. You're talking about what, how, what archaeologists describe as the third millennium BC. So that's from about 3000 BC and then coming closer to our time. So let's say they maybe got busy with their, with their picks and shovels, uh, maybe 2700, 2800 years BC. And then for centuries thereafter, and, and think about that, for hundreds of years after that first you know, shovel went in the ground. They were busy at Avebury. And it's hard, there might have been long periods of time when nothing was done at all. You know, we don't know if they were working there non-stop at any given period, but the, the work of, 
of digging the ditches, raising the banks, raising the stones, moving the stones around, is spread out over centuries. So it's a very slow motion process because, and it's not because it, it, it needn't necessarily have taken as long as it did. It's because the objective wasn't to finish. The objective was to be there and to be in the act of doing. That's what mattered. They were always making Avebury. And then the minute they decided to stop, they walked away from it and left it unfinished. But I just love, and I'm endlessly moved, profoundly moved by the idea that these places mattered as places to go and places to take part in and contribute to the construction of something that was endless. They just were there in the act of making. Each generation knew they wouldn't see it finished. They just contributed to it and their children would contribute to it and their children's children would contribute to it. Nobody ever came and cut a ribbon and said, Avebury's open. You know, there was never a big, <laughs> you know, that. That just didn't happen. That wasn't the point. It was not supposed to be finished. It was, it was finished with when they walked away from it for the last time. Generations on a mission, building the largest man-made prehistoric mound in Europe. 40 metres high, covering a footprint of nearly six acres. A colossal project that made a powerful statement. Our ancestors shouting from the past, we are here. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To ensure you get each new episode of this podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review, and share with your friends. You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these aisles of ours by going to my podcast's Instagram account, Neil Oliver Love Letter, and seeing the places I've chosen. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research was carried out by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance was taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. The post-production is the work of Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And a special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>